the Collider Collision Series with Jamie Sunsvog, sponsored by Collider Sustaining Sponsors. Thank you for your support of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Rochester and donors like you. Uh, welcome everybody to the Collider Online Collision Series. This is a virtual series of discussions by and for entrepreneurs in the Rochester community. Uh, my name is Jamie Sunsbach. I'm the Director of Operations at Collider, a Rochester nonprofit whose mission is to support our local entrepreneurs. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, just remember that today's session will be recorded and will be available via our YouTube and Facebook pages uh, tomorrow, as well as our online news site, Rochester Rising. Um, the format will be a sort of 10 minute presentation by our guests, followed by a Q&A for the balance of the hour. And since there are two people currently attending, um, you're going to get a lot of great time uh, with these two great guys. So I'm really excited about that. Um, we're excited to have Matt and Quinn Bissonnette from Bissonnette Leadership Services. Matt and Quinn are our newest members of Collider Coworking. I think they were members for all of like two days before before we were forced to shut down so uh, hopefully we can we can get them back and we can get the you know very very soon and and we can learn from each other because i think um, i've been really really impressed by what they're putting together here in their business and i think they can really help a lot of people so uh, without further ado uh, i'll turn it over to matt and quinn thanks jamie i'm gonna share a slide to your screen here. Please let me know, make sure that everybody gets it. Is it up there yet? If I see it. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, not an earth shattering slide, but yeah, we don't wanna be semi formal here. So, um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is actually the word leadership itself. You know, we throw that word around all the time, every day, and we have to associate it with things like formal role, authority, position, title, all that kind of stuff. We use it way too loosely, way too broadly, and that's not what leadership is. So it's important to understand that. Um, you know, really, when you think about who the most influential leaders in the world, you know who they are, who can you, I mean, if we were to take a stab at it, what most people say is, I don't know, president, religious leader, this person, this person, you know, maybe big sports figure. But the reality is, for most of us, the most influential leaders in the world are typically mom and dad, parents, right? That's number one. Number two is a brother or sibling or else a close relative. So that's important to think about because in the context of leadership, everybody says, well, you know, some leaders are born. And my comeback for that is I've never met a leader that wasn't born, meaning that everybody has the capacity for it. So we can all be leaders, right? Okay. So it's not just associated with title role. Everybody can do it. Um, what is leadership? Leadership is literally getting people with a common idea, a common interest, a community of people together and moving them towards a common vision, right? Literally a dream. What is a vision? A vision is a chronic, unattainable aspiration. Okay, that's important. I'll say that again, that's a chronic, it never goes away. Unattainable, you cannot attain a vision, something you're aspiring towards. How do we get closer to it? Well, we have these little things that happen along the way, right? That we call goals. And they're small sequential steps over time. And then that's part of the equation for what we say is success, okay? Uh, my favorite definition of success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. So progressive that you're working towards it, right? Realization that you actually achieve something, that's the goal attainment piece, that's your dopamine hit, right? And worthy ideal would be the vision. So via that very simple definition alone, in order to be successful, you have to be working towards a vision. And you have to be making steps actually to achieve it. So that could be riding a bike, right? right? It could be, I have four kids. So it could be uh, the vision for the kid to, you know, ride the bike is, you know, we make small sequential steps over time to get there. And if he does that, achieves those goals, that by that very simple definition is success. So that's important to understand. A lot of people confuse management with leadership. Management is all the stuff you cross off your list. It's, uh, I gotta, you know, I gotta balance the budget today. 
I got to figure out how to pay this employee today. I got to take a look at my inventory for this. I got to do this. It's all the tasky stuff that we do. A lot of people say, oh, you know, they're leadership. And this is something that happens in our society. Often we promote good manage, managers to leadership positions. And then we just have good managers in a position of leadership, but they're not good leaders. Okay. Um, so for most entrepreneurs, the difficult piece is putting yourself out in front as the leader to start generating that vision. So leadership alone is hard in any time, right? So this presentation is called Leading Now, Courage in Spades, because leading now amidst all this COVID and all this other stuff, especially for small businesses and entrepreneurs is more difficult than it's ever been literally since the depression. Um, I don't say that lightly, it is. And here's why. Uh, the first reason is uh, biologically something happens um, to us uh, when we are around things that make us scared. So we revert back to caveman times fight or flight, right? And it paralyzes us. So there's really only you know, two fears you're born with. It's loud noises and falling. Everything else is a conditioned response somewhere along the line. So it happens biologically. And we're scared, we're paralyzed, right? When we're paralyzed, productivity goes down, satisfaction goes down, happiness goes down, all that goes away. So that's one thing that happens biologically to us. And it's no fault of our own. Like I say, it's biology. It's there to protect us. The second piece is the societal impact. It's, it's the sociology piece, right? So everybody around there saying, our world is crumbling around us with all this COVID-19 stuff. And when it's a tremendous pressure and when we're inundated with chronic negativity, we revert back to that fear space and eventually we conform and we react. In that setting, coupled with biological response, man, that's a tough spot to be. It's really, really hard to get out of that space and say, man, how do I actually demonstrate leadership now as opposed to thinking, geez, how am I just going to manage my business? Because you have to differentiate the two. Of course, just so I can say it's um, literally, especially in today's market, given what we have going on. So that's the difference between management, the difference between management, the difference between leadership, what leadership actually is, why it's so hard now, why it happens to us. I think that's important to understand. There's a biological reason and societal reason. Uh, we're going to give you just a real simple, easy acronym, consistent with the word courage, uh, some brief little tactics, and then hopefully we have some questions that evolve around there to help you walk through how can you move forward um, as a leader. So I'm going to advance the slide here, and then Matt's going to take over. All right, thanks for being here. So brave. So this is the time you got to be brave. We're in the midst of a crisis. You got to step up as a leader. So we made this little acronym here that kind of reminds some of the some of the attributes of a leader, some of the things you need to do uh, in order to move your organization forward, whether it's a, a small entrepreneurial operation or whether it's a humanitarian nonprofit, uh, whatever it is, uh, the same attributes of leadership will apply. The first one, B. B is be visible. This is you've got to continue to press out there, have a growth mindset, engage with your customers, engage with your clients, be out there. Uh, you need not just the management by walking around thing. This is about being out there, having your face in the community, having your face with your customers, um, engaging with them, having conversations with them, being present with them. That's the first piece. Don't shrink back. That's that fear thing Kuna's talking about. Don't shrink back. Press out. This is the time you press out because people are looking for someone to be out there in front of them. Ours remain calm. You might be scrambling on the inside, but you got to remain calm because your presence, your attitude will set the tone for the culture around you. Uh, we've all had those leaders who are frazzled, running around crazy, and you can just feel it in the office that day. That's what I'm talking about. If you remain calm and you find a way to process your own anxiety, the people around you will remain calm. They'll be able to continue to work from the front of their brain, right, and stay engaged and, and service your clients and your customers. So be out there, be present, remain calm. A is for align your resources. This is where you guys start thinking about how am I going to come out of this crisis? This could be changing your supply chain. It could be changing your vendors. It could be changing um, how your donor processes work. So if you're a humanitarian nonprofit and you supply, uh, you work off of donations, uh, right now, everybody's kind of pulling back on their financials. So you have to rethink, how do we begin 
to provide value to all these people in the community such that they're willing to give us donations, right? Or if you're a, a supplier of a product, how do we make sure that our product continues to get pushed out there and people want to buy that product? Uh, do we have a supply chain that continues to give us the things we need to make our product? Uh, if you're buying stuff from, let's say, China, for example, uh, that supply chain might not be as fluid as it used to be. So maybe you have to look for local vendors in order to get that process to continue to keep going. So align your, align your resources now. Think about where you're at and what's coming next in order for your, your organization to have some lift to it as these restrictions come off. V is validate your, your decisions with data. There's going to be uh, there's going to be the idea, I'm just going to do what I used to do, or my gut tells me I should do this, or I think I should do that, or maybe your friend says, well, you know, I think we're doing this in my business, that might work. That's all good information, but it's all tangential. You want to process that information and crunch it through some numbers. What's your business plan? What's your budget? What do you need to have to get going? Uh, what do, what do your clients' numbers look like? Do you have to have a certain number of members for membership? Do you have to have a certain number of sales for revenue? So find out what the data says and make your decisions based on the data as best you can project it into the future where you're going. And then lastly, Quinn? So lastly is E for empathy. And quite frankly, I think that's the most important one. Uh, it's gonna take a lot of work a lot of work to demonstrate leadership the way our environment is right now. And what will endear you to your employees, to your consumers, and then when I say consumers, that can be customers, it can be anyone on down the line, is going to be your authentic ability to connect with them, to see them where they're at. Part of creating a community is connecting with people. When we feel like we belong to something, we're willing to give our best efforts and that's where we move closer to self-actualization. But that can only happen when you connect with someone empathically. Now, a lot of people say, oh, you know, empathy, that's that soft skill thing. That's that soft skill thing that doesn't, you know, whatever. You know, thank you, Matt, for the first four, you know, hard stuff. And here comes Quinn with the soft stuff. You know, empathy absolutely is a validated tactical skill. And it's a very hard. endears you to that person and they're going to come back to your particular product or they're going to come back to work with you for your particular business not because of the product or because of the paycheck or because of the potential long-term earnings they're going to come back for you you know that's that's the uh, the quote is uh, people people quit good jobs because of bad leaders or bad managers all the time that's exactly it so wherever you're at in your particular you know business you're set up with all of this stuff going on yeah it's going to take a lot of courage to get out there you can walk through this acronym, but make sure that you don't forget the E to be empathic and connect with them somehow empathically. You know, a lot of folks say I'm an introvert, right? When I can't get out there, I'm not going to do that. That's not my thing. I'm a behind the scenes kind of guy. I'm like, I totally get that. You can, I'm an introvert too, right? You can totally be a behind the scenes kind of guy and do all that stuff. But somehow then your product has to come from you because ultimately that's the connection. This is the, this is like the uh, Simon Sinek piece of the show, right? People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So whatever it is that you're selling, that particular product is a reflection of you. And that's the empathic piece. Do not discount empathy, especially in these times when you gotta be courageous. I'm gonna flip to the next slide here that says, thank you. It has Matt and I's uh, website on there. I'm gonna take down the share here. It should come back to seeing us as individuals. And uh, at this point, uh, we're thrilled to share our perspective with you guys on leadership. We hope you found some value in that brief limited content. And we'd like to know how can we help you? What questions do you have for us? All right, awesome. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, I think typically we just have people ask questions in chat, but I think we have a small intimate group here. So uh, feel free. Uh, to uh, just jump in, unmute yourself, and uh, ask a question. Uh, hopefully, we don't talk over each other. Again, it's a small group, so uh, please just uh, unmute and, and ask a question. Unless you have no questions. There we go. I have a question. 
This is Grace. Um, my question is, do you all use any um, like leadership typing types of tools or do you use any other leadership development tools? I guess one of the, uh, one of the examples that I would um, suggest for a leadership, like not typing tool necessarily, but we use StrengthsFinder a lot um, at work and we've seen a lot of um, success there in the ability to understand how each individual operates and then how our team can um, coalesce together and be most efficient. Do you guys have any other suggestions um, or things you've seen you've had success with? Yeah, so there's tons of tools out there, right? Um, and here's the thing about tools. Tools are, are just as valuable uh, as how they're employed, right? And most tools are objective. Um, and so that kicks out, you know, whether it's Myers-Briggs or whether it's StrengthFinder, you know, 2.0 or whatever it is, it kicks out some sort of um, objective, you know, narrative or what we think this person could potentially be good at. And when we see that, what happens to us in our brain when we see that, then we say, oh, yeah, you know what? That is me, right? That is me. And the problem with a lot of those tools is they don't ask open-ended questions and we have subjective answers to get people to really dig down and dive and find out what really is most consistent with my passion and my purpose. And they get locked in the tunnel vision of what we think they're good at. So a lot of times we put people um, in strength-based leadership positions because we've kind of self-identified those strengths from a lot of those tools. And then people do that job you know, because that's their goal and they build some skills and abilities around it. And it actually starts this pendulum, right? There's this goal, I'm gonna get this job. Now I get the skills and abilities around it overlaps like this. And they go back and forth between those two for a period of time because somebody thought that's what they should do. And then they associate that with success. And they do that for five years and then they become a manager and then they do it for 10 years and then they become a higher level manager and they do it for 20 years and they become a director and then they've been working for 40 years and then they find out they're not happy. And the problem is because there's actually a third sphere that we don't consider, especially here in the United States, and that's uh, the emotional connection, and that's back to the empathy piece. If you think about drawing those three spheres at the confluence in the middle, that's where we say people operate from a state of flow. That's when they would go do their work for free because it's who they are, it's what they want to do. So uh, long-winded answer to your question, is there any particular tool? No, nah, I think they're all about the same. Um, but if you can get someone to that emotional piece to figure out what they're deeply emotional about, I would start there. And that's what I typically try to do and then work our way back. Um, for uh, males, it's usually something that you sensationalized about um, as a career between the ages of 12 and 18. For females, it's a little earlier be between uh, 10 and 16 because apparently a female brain develops much faster than us guys. And you know, that might even be too broad for us to say we're ready at 18. Um, so when I coach, uh, folks, I tell them, take it back to that and think about what did you really love to do? What were you passionate about? What did you absolutely love to do? What were you stoked about? What were you thrilled to do? And just about nine times out of 10, they could come back to something. And then we would unalign that with the goal and then build the strengths and abilities around it, as opposed to saying goals and strengths and abilities. Um, there's a reason why most major uh, Fortune 500 execs in the United States aren't from the United States. Because here, we tell people, set a goal, build the skills and abilities, that equals success, then you'd be happy. Doesn't work that way, right? Happiness is the precursor to success, not the result of it. A lot of immigrants come into this country with a dream, something they're deeply passionate about, and they're willing to make tremendous sacrifice along the way. But they never give up on that emotional piece, that purpose. Then they build the goals, the skills and abilities, and that's how they get there. Long-winded answer. That's my perspective. So there's lots of tools, Grace. There's uh, situational leadership. Uh, Speed Leads does a conflict management tool. It tells you what kind of conflict management you are. Uh, there's DISC. There's Myers-Briggs. There's uh, Strengths. Uh, all excellent tools, right? They're all excellent tools. But Quinn's right. If you start from the premise of who you are as a person and you understand that leadership is action, not a position, then you begin to go, how do I use these tools? How do I deploy these tools to understand myself more so I can be a better effective leader um, no matter where I work, right? Um, so it starts with that passion and then that flows out of there. So lots of good tools out there. Um, if you're a strength-based organization, just don't get pigeonholed into your top five uh, because that's what they think you do. 
when your passion might be reflected differently if given the opportunity. Um, again, where Quinn says you have those two different things, make sure you don't get stuck in those two things when your passion is the third circle. Great. Uh, other questions? Uh, Jane, I think maybe you had a question? And mulling some things over, um, I couldn't agree with you more on we actually know intuitively what a passion is at a much younger age than what we think. Um, my husband wanted to go into farming. He knew he wanted to go into farming. He knew that at 12 years old, but a struggling family dairy farm, the cows got sick, the barn burned. It just, his dad said, no, you're going to college. So he went to college. He's never had the chance to go back to what his passion is. And so our small business is helping him in a different way, get back to the agricultural base. Um, how much do you think personality plays into, because we all come with a personality of one sort or another, um, how much does that play into our ability to learn to be strong leaders? Because I can do all kinds of tasks, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm a leader. So your question is how to, how to be a strong leader? How much does personality play in the ability to become a strong leader? Could you want to take it first? Yeah, <clears throat> a lot less than you think. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me still? Everybody hear yeah. me? Okay? Yep. Yeah, a lot less than you think. Um, and again, <clears throat> you know, personalities, yeah, we all have different DNAs. Um, and personality is a reflection of our DNA. Again, this is the biology piece. Um, but how we project that is usually because something somewhere along the line, something has conditioned us to behave that certain way. So here's an example. Um, I have four boys. Um, and the oldest boy, uh, we call him Smokey, uh, because when he was a baby, he would <laughs> blow his diapers off. We'll think of something cool when he gets older. Um, but Smokey goes to an after school program in Stuartville here in Minnesota, and they call that program Tiger Time. And um, when he goes there, um, after school, they play in the gym all the time, all those kinds of things, fine. Okay, so I go there one day, and I notice he's sitting on the edge of the gym, and all the other kids are playing a game of lightning, they're playing a basketball game, but Smokes is not playing. And so he comes out of the gym, and I just naturally assume he got out of the game of lightning. So I asked Smokes, I'm like, ah, what, did you get out of the game or what, buddy? And he says, no, Dad, I can't play lightning. I'm like, well, why not, buddy? And he's like, well, Dad, I'm, I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. I can't make the basket. I'm like, well, whoever told you that, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, the kids, some of the helpers at Tiger Time. And so, you know, I started talking to Smokes, and he was learning the word ability at that time, like A-B-I-L-I-T-Y. And we would talk about that all the time and he had heard, heard the story of a Minnesota Vikings nice. would associate the word ability with Adam Thielen and he started this little thing that we would call the sun-up sermon and he would say um, it's possible I'm the one I expect to be successful just like Adam Thielen I work hard to believe in myself I will about my dreams and so when he came out of that gym and I said hey smokes what about the you know the whole Adam Thielen thing the sun-up sermon the whole ability thing and he, mean, and he says you mean like if I work hard and believe in myself I can do it I'm like, well, I don't know, it's worth a shot. That's what we preach all the time, right? And uh, he was seven at the time, I think, seven, six, seven. Tab seven must have been. And so we went home and we mulled it over and I dropped him off at school the next day and went to my day job and then picked him up after school. And this time Smokes came running out of the gym and he comes running out and he goes, six, 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 dad, whoa, six. And I'm like, yeah, six, I can count. Good job, buddy. Well, you got to go. Well, you know what? He says, no, dad. He says, dad, I made six baskets today. And lightning. And that's what I'm talking about. The problem here is a lot of people at a very young age, they start to become what everybody thinks they should become. And they become naturally the sum composite average of everybody else. Right? And then we start to think like everybody else. We build this peer group and we get about the same grades as everybody else. And we go about the same parties as everybody else. And we get about the same degrees as everybody else. And we move through this, you know, this kind of this perpetual wheel. And, you know, somewhere along the line, we think that that's our identity and that's who we really are. It doesn't have to be that way. Absolutely doesn't have to be that way. 
So if you're having trouble thinking about how do I get out there and demonstrate that leadership because I'm afraid that's just not my personality, I'm going to tell you, you have the absolutely the potential. Everybody has the potential, but it's going to take practice. And it'll take deliberate practice. And that's another thing Matt and I talk about. You know, if you think about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, if you think about a triangle like this, the bottom rung would be deliberate practice. And the, the word uh, deliberate is essential there, okay? Because things don't happen organically, right? A lot of people say, well, you know, to be great at anything, it takes 10 years or 10,000 hours. Actually, there were some white papers written about that several years ago. Turns out that's just a bunch of garbage, right? Because just because, um, just because Matt and I, uh, maybe I'm in a formal leadership position in my organization, but just that title alone, if I'm in there for 10 years, doesn't necessitate effective leadership. You have to deliberately practice it over time. Deliberately practice the skills that we outlined here today. Read, research, deliberately practice that. And then over time, only then does it become habitual, the next rung up in the pyramid. And then over more time, then it becomes culture and then part of your identity. So it's perfectly normal to struggle with personalities and saying, huh, I don't know if this is for me. How do I go in front of this? That is perfectly normal. No fault of anybody. But the answer is, it's really not part of the equation. The equation is, if we deliberately practice anything, we can absolutely get there. You just got to believe in yourself and let people tell you. Don't let people tell you you can't. It's not real. My thoughts. I agree with it completely. I mean, some of the last thing he said there is, you got to believe in yourself. There's a, a fair amount of wiring, conditioning, things you've been told your life. Um, that maybe you're the number two person. You're good enough to be number two, but not the number one. Um, that's all in your head. And so, it, so that's where you have to have that courage to take those steps. So if somebody has a project at work and you volunteer for it, that the first step of leadership, you're, you're practicing what it is to step out and lead. It's just those one step at a time like that. Over time, you'll take more and more steps. You'll have more and more chances. Uh, read, listen to podcasts, uh, talk to people, find a mentor. Those are all things that begin to feed into you it changes your mindset because if your mindset says I have the ability I can do this then you'll be a leader it's not about it. uh, leadership is action not a position are Great. there different styles of leadership because you know from my work experience you've got collaborative type leadership you've got the boss man type leadership or boss woman type leadership where they're the king and the rest of us just have to follow along. Um, it, to me, that's always been interesting to study what, what got a person to where, to the position that they're at. Um, is it personality? Is it intentional living? Is it setting a goal and climbing over people's backs to get there? What is it that gets somebody from rank and file to um, a management or director level? It, it could be any of those things. I mean, you think of military leaders, uh, they are type A, uh, I'm in charge, they make decisions and people follow. Not because they want them to follow, because they have to follow, right? So that's one type of leadership. There's a, uh, an organization out there called Situational Leadership. Um, they, there's a book about that. Uh, it talks about the different types of leadership that are out there. A good leader really has the ability to move between the different types of leadership. Collaborative leadership, uh, empowering leadership is really the most effective of any of the bunch because that's where you're actually pulling people together and more people can do more together than one person can by themselves. Uh, again, it starts way back in the way back in little kid age, right? Uh, sometimes they say that uh, students uh, who participate in athletics and team sports they, they learn some of those leadership skills and team skills early on. So maybe they move faster into those kind of jobs, uh, but it's not guaranteed. A lot of this has to do with just the individual's uh, persistence on what they want to do. Uh, how many of you uh, remember all the superstars from high school? Where are they today? They're not necessarily superstars in the country. Uh, what happened? Well, they were all superstars. Well, because that environment fed what they needed to do but now that they're out here in this different, different environment, are they still growing at the same rate and pace? And maybe they've become accustomed to, and now I'm part of the crowd, right? So it's, it's a matter of what are you intentionally doing, deliberative actions, Quinn said, to build into yourself. Those who build in grow, those who don't, don't. And I'll chime in on the situational leadership piece. I mean, it's, it's important for 
literally different situations. You know, like you think, you, you know, if it's a, you know, some sort of tragic accident, those are command decisions, right? So it has to happen, has to happen fast. It's an emergency. You know, if it's, you know, thinking about, okay, what's the future of the organization? Well, you know, that should probably be a collaborative, you know, conversation uh, where the leader is trying to paint that vision, you know, with all the like-minded people going the same direction. Um, I, and I would say this is back to the empathy piece, which is the ability to connect with people. And that's a skill. It's something you have to practice over time. And you can be introverted or extroverted either way and do exactly that. Good question. Great. Uh, other questions from our, our esteemed guests of th our three guests. <laughs> I guess uh, I could ask a question just uh, touching on, you know, some of the stuff we were just talking about, um, you know, I, I've seen a lot in the last couple of weeks, you know, I, I've seen really esteemed leaders in, in our community or in our, in, in certain businesses um, that you look to and you think these are great leaders, you know, and then suddenly this COVID situation hits and it seems like these leaders kind of fall apart. Um, you know, and obviously it's a, it's a pretty unique situation, but at the same time, I've seen a lot of people that at least from my day-to-day -day interactions with them, had very, you know, I would say are pretty, uh, are not the person I would pick out as a leader, really step up in a time of crisis and lead. So um, do you just want to, if you could speak to some of that and why that switch occurs for some people, either one way or the other? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump in here. <clears throat> so absolutely, uh, Jamie, the problem with that is historically, we promote all these people to positions of authority and we assume that's leadership. It doesn't mean they have the leadership skills. That doesn't mean they have the ability to connect with people empathically. You know, maybe they have been the person climbing over everybody to get there. They're chasing the money, right? They're chasing the money or the goal or whatever it is. Doesn't mean they're effective at all. And then when the crisis hits, they don't have the capacity for leadership. They never have. And so they react in a space of fear biologically and because of society, that's what they do. And so they fall apart. And so I think it's an awesome question and I think it's an awesome example because those people that have the capacity for leadership that maybe have been doing it all along, but haven't been in a formal leadership position, then they're the ones that appear like they're stepping up, but they're not. They've been leading all along. We've just not associated with them with that title, but they've been leaders all along. So in times of crisis, absolutely, those are the people that rise above because they're not afraid to demonstrate leadership. I think that's super cool. Is there so many people out there in a community like that that are starting to pop up that people will now forever and going forward think about, wow, think about the fantastic things that particular individual did and they did it empathically. They did it because they cared. They did it collaboratively, right? It wasn't anything about position, title, any of that kind of stuff, authority. It was to help. They care. Awesome question. Great example. So uh, to that point, Jamie, um, I've noticed uh, in Rochester, I, I'm gonna get the name wrong. It's uh, Shop Roch or uh, Local local Roch Support, I think is what it's called. Uh, it's where the, all the restaurants got together. There was this, this group of individuals in town here that really pulled together to try and bring all these different resources to bear. I don't think any one of those individuals who were part of that were really actually a formal organizational leader necessarily. It was this grassroots group of people, and it was all based on relationship. They knew each other. They had a passion to see each other succeed, and they came together and just created these great tools, these great opportunities. Uh, there's a t-shirt guy in town here who's doing some work where he's helping businesses out. Uh, that's leadership, classic leadership right there. When they step up and do that, that is stepping into the void. That is being uh, all those things you need to be to be a leader. Uh, leadership is action, not a position. So it's it's great to watch these groups come together, these grassroots groundswells come together. Um, and I think Quinn's right. Uh, we, we so often uh, conflate the idea of management and leadership and people get promoted and promoted and promoted and they're excellent at the management tasks. When it comes time to lead and you have to move beyond the, the standard management tasks and now you have to forge into this chaos of leadership, 
they're not prepared for it because that's not their skill set. That's not what they've been doing for all these all these years. There's this uh, phrase that I've heard: uh, anyone can hold the helm when the sea is calm. You think about that. Anyone can hold the helm when the sea is calm. But when you got big waves, who do you want on the on the on the wheel, right? So that's the difference between management and leadership. Yeah, and that person holding the helm, they might not have any idea about the bottom line. They might not know how to budget. They might not know about marketing. They might not know about strategy, but they sure know how to get some people together for a common vision, like-minded folks going the same direction because they legitimately, authentically care. Yeah, exactly. What other questions do you have for us? Just a warning, you have to listen to all my questions if you, <laughs> if you don't ask some of your own, for sure. Hey, Quinn, can you hear me? Joy Tool, how are you, Tool Man? <laughs> hey, Quinn, I'm a big fan. I had to, hey, I'm sorry, I came, I came in late to this and uh, I caught you at the end, end piece when you're talking about um, empathy. Sure. And I, not necessarily just a question, but, you know, I'm new into my management or back into management after 20 some years. And um, I can honestly say that I'm deliberately putting that into my practice um, where, especially right now, when you're communicating and working with your staff, talking about, you know, decreased wages and furloughs and everything like that, but going beyond and putting that empathic piece like, I'm them and they have to, I'm in their shoes. They're the ones that are dealing with their hourly employees and they have tons of questions and I'm giving them everything I can, information, putting myself in their shoes. And uh, I'm just, my point is that I've received so much good feedback, you know, wonderful emails from my team. And I mean, I'm with them and it feels good. And I, and I can honestly, I just want to back that up because for me being myself, you know what I mean? Being true to myself, not worrying about what anybody else thinks, being in their shoes is making all the difference in the world for me. And I'm loving it. And uh, yeah, and the only thing I can say for me to get to where I want to go is to tie exactly what I'm saying with. Uh, being competent because I'm new to this job and I got to put 110% in to figure out exactly the work they're doing and to do the, just to have that knowledge set that will get me a long ways. I believe that's just, that's just my thoughts. I wanted to share. Those are great thoughts. Awesome. Troy, you're dead on man. Come on. Right. Anything worth accomplishing in life takes hard work. You know that you got to work hard. Right. Those competencies and the rest of that stuff. That's part of the package. But, but what you're doing is you're endearing those employees to you, not because uh, as a, you know, an employee engaged interaction, because you care. That's the difference. It's that empathic connection. You know why it feels good? Why do you think it feels good, Trey? Well, because they feel good. You know right. what I mean? They feel like they belong. What's the chemical it makes you feel like you belong? What's the chemical? Oxytocin, buddy. Yeah. What's that? Oxytocin. When you create a greater oh, sense of community and you feel like you belong to something, that's the ultimate happiness chemical. Oxytocin. It's the same chemical that's released when mothers give birth to the baby. It endears them to one another. It's the same thing that empathy does when you have conversations with folks. That's what you're doing. That's, and that's why it feels good. I'm just telling you, that's the biology piece behind it. Strong work, Joy. Thank you. Yeah, I wrote that, I wrote that down. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll ask another question. So uh, a lot of times my work deals with early stage, you know, entrepreneurs. These are people with ideas who are just thinking about getting started and they're just, you know, firing on all cylinders. Like they have to take care of everything from the ground up. They have to get established. They have to get their product perfected, get it out. Um, what are the top, like, besides uh, engaging you guys and uh, for mentoring and coaching, um, you know, what are sort of maybe the top three things that a new entrepreneur could use to really develop their leadership skills while they're doing everything else at the same time? 
Got that. Got me. Go ahead. So I would say, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, a solopreneur, you're just getting going. Um, the first thing you really have to, to work on is your self-belief. I mean, you've got to really dig in and go, I, I can do this. I believe in myself. I have what it takes to make this thing happen. Uh, all the nuts and bolts of pulling a business together and meet marketing and media and supplies and all that kind of stuff, it all comes back to whether or not you believe you can do it. So I would say the very first part is, is investing in yourself. And that might be that you have to pull some people around you. Maybe it's a mentor. Maybe it's being part of a positive community of people like you, uh, like the Collider, for example. Um, but that's where it starts. And then intentionally pouring into yourself, like podcasts, books, uh, going to One Million Cups and hearing about other people's successful stories, those kind of things. I mean, you really, you really have to be investing in yourself to, to make that leap from, I wonder if I can do this to, oh yeah, I got this. Who's coming with me? Go ahead, what do you think? Yeah, so don't confuse movement with progress, especially in terms of leadership, right? So you can have all these things going, you're trying to, you're a solopreneur and you got all this, this huge big package going, nobody's gonna buy the package without you, right? The package doesn't exist without you. So the package, you know, we think is the product, but the product is really the person. So we're going to take you back to the belief thing again, because we call it activation energy. So activation energy, the amount of energy required to do anything, right? So that's back to the deliberate practice piece. Um, the more you do it over time, it decreases the activation energy, the easier it becomes. So you can have a phenomenal product, but nobody's buying your product. They're buying you the person. So if your product is not reflective of your personality as you as a person, nobody cares. You know, I can buy a you know, a rug from here, I can buy shoes from here, but we buy them because those products are created with the person in mind, right? This is the Simon Sinek thing. Again, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So if you're just getting started, make sure that you are brave, that you're out front doing all those things, that you're connecting empathically as much as you can with the market and the consumer, and don't misinterpret that your, you know, fancy little gadget is going to take off and run by itself. It's not going to happen. Right? It's going to take you as the individual, and you're going to have to practice that over time to do it. Did that answer your question, Jamie? Yeah, absolutely. All right, we probably have time for one more question. Otherwise, I have another question, but I would definitely love to hear from the audience. I have a kind of related question to the whether what can solopreneurs or entrepreneurs do when they're crazy busy trying to figure out their business, their model, their strategy, all of that stuff. Um, what is the biggest mistake an entrepreneur can do that will like undermine their ability to bring people into their vision and get them to, to go along with them in that vision? Wasting time. Um, Time is finite, right? We all only have so much time. Everybody says, I don't have any time. I'm being pulled in 10,000 different directions. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. The quote is, the billionaire and the beggar have the same 24 hours in a day, right? We all have enough time. The problem is we're not investing value in the limited time that we have. Now, value is subjective. So you could say, you know, I want to spend more time with my kids. Well, if you spend five hours with them, and you're giving them 100% of your attention, or you spend five minutes with them and get them 100% of your attention. That's what I'm talking about. So in terms of entrepreneurs and startups and you know, any organization, it's that we waste too much time. Uh, we associate things like, oh, I spent 10 hours working on this project. Well, how did you get 10 productive hours out of it? How much value did you get into it? You know, or did you need to step away and maybe only got one productive hour in it? Make sure they're trusting value in the limited time that you have because it is finite. That's my thoughts. And to go right along with that, I would say patience. Uh, if you're gonna start a business and you think in three weeks you're gonna make your first million, probably not gonna work out that way. Uh, patience, persistence, it's that manage your time, use it well, and stick with it. You've got to just stick with it and be patient. If you're really truly being the person that Quinn talked about and you're driving your product forward, it will be successful. So manage your time, be patient, be you, like Troy said, and move forward. Yep, I mean, 
people are successful in this world because they make a business decision to be successful. It doesn't just happen organically. So it takes hard work. It's supposed to. It's supposed to be hard. Otherwise, everybody else would, would be there. Right. All right. Um, I have, uh, I'm going to ask you a lightning round question because uh, at the same time, we're going to launch a poll for those of you watching on a video stream. So please, uh, when I ask the lightning round question, you can definitely listen to the, uh, to the answers from our guests, but at the same time, please uh, answer the survey. It's a very simple one question survey on, uh, would you recommend this event to others? Um, so I will go ahead and launch that poll right now. And uh, for our guests, please don't vote. <laughs> it's the only time I'm gonna tell you not to vote. Um, so the question for you, uh, Matt and Quinn would be, who is your own personal leader that inspires you? So I'm not taking the survey, I'm answering your question, right? Right, so yes. Personal, the personal leader that inspires me is Winston Churchill. Uh, here's a guy who went through uh, a career ending uh, early on in his military career. It was a career ending battle that he lost. And yet he came back, uh, stayed in politics and went on to lead England through World War II uh, in a dramatic fashion. So I think uh, failure uh, is not fatal. Uh, but success takes time and persistence. So I think Winston Churchill is who I look to. Mine's maybe not as famous. Um, mine was early on in my career, a um, uh, colorectal surgeon who historically had a reputation of being, you know, really kind of very aggressive and <clears throat> wasn't very popular with a lot of people. Um, but he took me in. I think we lost him again. <laughs> In the world, you're just not. Oh, <laughs> this is the, you know. I was I was waiting for this story. Um, hey, Quinn, we lost you there again. Yep. Quinn, say it again. Say it again. Round two. Okay, still there. Yep. Okay. Yep, we're good now. So, okay, so colorectal surgeon took. How far did I get? Colorectal surgeon. About uh, there. That about that far. Yeah. Get, <laughs> got to the so I got in the office. Got in the office, and uh, I was looking for my lashing. Like, oh, this is gonna be awful. You know, I'm crippling, you know, shaking in my boots. And he said, you know, Quinn, you got all potential in the world. You're just not acting on it. And he told me a quote and he said, vision uh, without execution is hallucination. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means at the time. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, man, that's it. I got all these wild, crazy dreams, this personality to tell people all these things and want to do all this and I'm not acting on it. So that's what, that's what grounds me. I come back to it all the time. He's the greatest mentor in my life. Um, has been. I've named one of my kids after him, uh, actually. So I still reach out to him as often as I can. Um, and so, yeah, that's the most influential person for me. And I would, I would uh, sensationalize as, as much as I can about that, that quote, vision without execution is nothing more than a hallucination. So. Great. Well, this brings us to the end of our time. So I want to reach out to Matt and Quinn one last time and say, where can people find you? And uh, learn everything there is to know about great leadership. So you can find us uh, on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or on the World Wide Web at www.bissonetls.com. We're Bissonette Leadership Services. All right. Quinn, anything to add? I don't think so. I think he's got them all down. He's, he did a good job of keeping track of that. <laughs> he's the sales guy. <laughs> Brains going awesome. that person. Well, uh, Matt and Quinn, thank you so much for joining us and uh, enlightening, on, uh, enlightening us on more about leadership, which is so critical right now. And, uh, and, and thank you for being here and thank you for everybody for joining as well. Uh, make sure to follow Collider and Rochester Rising social media channels for upcoming events over the next couple of weeks. And for those uh, at least uh, two and a half, I'll count Grace as a half of you that are members of our co-working space. Um, you know, please check out our Slack channel uh, as well, and you'll see the upcoming events as well as videos from previous events. So uh, stay safe, everyone, and have a great day.